Welcome everyone to Embrace Your Glow. We're living the soft life here. I'm Carlisha Bradley, founder and executive director of Women Empowering Nations. And I'm joined and I'm, today by... <laughs> I'm Demetria Kinsley, Global VP of Marketing for Cantu Beauty. It's great to be here with you all today. I have the privilege of being a co-host for today's event. Before we get started, I wanted for you to drop in the chat where you are joining us from. Yes, share where you are coming from all over the world and utilize that chat box during our time together. We're looking forward to an immersive day of focusing on the soft life. We're talking about mental health and well-being for Black women. And so prepare yourself to be transformed as we unravel the secrets of embracing a softer, more fulfilling existence, uncovering invaluable strategies to nurture your mental well-being and holistic care. So are you ready to live the soft life? If so, let me see it in the comments. I already see that we have women from Nigeria, Ghana, Kuwait, uh, New Orleans, Philly, Cape Town, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Denver, Colorado. I love to see it. But before we get started today, I want to share a bit more about Women Empowering Nations. Women Empowering Nations is an international nonprofit organization that's committed to the exposure and development of black girls, accelerating their path to executive leadership. We do this through in-school mentorship programs, the GLOW Global Cohort, Girls Leading Our World, and our GLOW Global Network. And we're so honored to do this in partnership with Cantu Beauty. Cantu is honored to be the sponsor of the GLOW Global Cohort. If you're not familiar with Cantu, we are a textured hair care brand that is distributed all around the world. It's because of you, the people on this call, that have gotten us to where we are today. And that's why we want to make sure that we're not just giving back here, but we're giving back all over. And the Glow Global Cohort together uh, brings 50 emerging leaders from seven countries for an immersive three-month leadership development experience, touching on topics such as culture and identity, public speaking, personal and professional branding, executive leadership, in social justice and advocacy. This is our second year partnering on the cohort. I love hearing reflections from cohort members about their experience. Let's roll the 2023 GLOW Global Cohort recap video that highlights the experience of a few of this year's members. Women Empowering Nations, in partnership with Cantu Beauty, hosted the 2023 GLOW Global Cohort, bringing together 50 leaders from seven countries around the world. Hear reflections from some of our cohort members from around the world. My cohort experience has been amazing. The most important thing about this is really bringing Black women from all across the diaspora to be in community with one another, to support each other, motivate each other. The session comes, you go blow the way, you're like, this is my favorite session. And then you go for the next one and then it exceeds it. And you're like, no, forget it. This is my favorite session. It feels like now in my journey, either professionally or personally, I have people that I can work with and that I'm never alone. Interacting with women across the diaspora has always been a dream of mine. Black people are really everywhere. <laughs> Seeing Black women from all over seven different countries has, it's been, I can't even give it a word. It's just been mind blowing. And this photo right here, I think, reminds me of the spirit of glow and holding hands across the world. We don't usually see women going out for what they want so passionately. Some people were like, they work with politicians. They, um, some people are doing media, some people are into, into PR. And one thing that was really surprising for me was when Abba, we had a conversation with Abba, and she said that she works at the White House. And I'm like, how old are you? What I think the benefit of sisterhood is, is the constant reminder of not fitting yourself to be in the space you are, but thinking about how you can bring yourself to every space. So how I would pitch the, this experience to other women like me, this is bigger than leadership development. This is personal development, right? And I'm just so excited to see like how we grow as a community after this experience. And I feel like so many other girls need to know about this opportunity because 
it's definitely changed my life personally and professionally. Like when I started the program, I was so lost with whatever I wanted to do with my life. I didn't have much confidence and now I just feel empowered. This cohort made me more confident about telling my story. I, I don't think I've ever experienced anything this good. I feel like I just mature like 10 years in just a span of a few weeks. I think this experience has made me see myself in ways that I didn't want to see myself. And it's so, it's so illuminating in who I am and it's given me the space to kind of be okay with existing in my blackness and being a woman and being Muslim and all these parts of me that have been celebrated here, it's made me want to celebrate them like outside of this space. I think having a program that was specifically focused on black women, run by black women, to serve black women with amazing, empowering black women speaking with us, I don't know if I would have found that anywhere else. And that's why I was so thrilled to be one of the 50 chosen. I am so touched and amazed by our cohort members. Their journey and this experience, going through professional branding, executive leadership, going on their journey, learning about how to be advocates for social justice while still prioritizing their own care and well being. The future is so bright, and I am so proud of our 2023 Glow Global cohort members. You heard reflections from a few of them, but we also had a 2022 cohort. So we are 100 alumni strong in the Glow Global experience. And later, you'll get to hear more about what they were able to accomplish as a result of their cohort experience and the events that they planned all over the world. The impact is massive, but we also want to invite you to be a part of this network. So Women Empowering Nations, when we had the cohort this year, we had over 2,600 applications for the Glow Global cohort, and we only had 50 spots. But we decided to make a new network that provides professional development training, career opportunities, and community for young Black leaders all over the world. You can be a part of the Women Empowering Nations Glow Global Network you apply to join at wenations.org slash network. And when you apply to be a part of this community, you will be joined by young women all over and receive some of the coaching and development that we're able to offer to our cohort members. Please head over to wenations.org slash network to apply to join the GLOW Global Network. But we're about to get ready for this conversation and discussion with some game changing game-changing women from all over the world. I'm going to turn it over to Demetria to get ready to introduce our panelists for Embrace Your Glow. I am just so excited to be able to introduce some trailblazers who are really changing the world. And for those who are interested in the network, this just gives you a teaser of what it's like to be part of this powerful sisterhood called Women Empowering Nations. First up, I have Hawa Ojefo, is a prominent figure in the mental health space in Nigeria who serves as the executive director of She Writes Woman, SWW. She has become the voice and face of mental health in the country, earning local and international honors. Hawa is a certified integrative mental health coach and the creator of Safe Place Nigeria, a virtual community offering mental health support. Her impressive list of accolades includes the Queen's Young Leaders Award, MTV Generation Change Award, and her recognition as an Obama Africa leader. Hawa has been featured in major media outlets worldwide and has addressed the United Nations on crucial issues. Passionate about advocating for mental health laws and policies, she continues to inspire change makers while prioritizing her own well being. And we also have Dr. Garika Sanford works from the belief that authentic, authenticity um, and, and vulnerability, self-reflective relationships with ourselves and others cultivates whole person wellness. Trained as a clinical psychologist, Dr. Sanford 
partners with clients to increase insight, attunement, and self-compassion as they seek understanding and transformation that deepens relational connection. In addition to her role as a psychologist, Dr. Sanford provides executive coaching to powerful, high-achieving leaders committed to impacting community and social change. As an executive coach, Dr. Sanford creates space for clients to explore personal, professional, and organizational development as they journey to embody integral and whole person leadership. Collaboration, self-reflection, and continuous learning are foundational aspects of her practice as a leader, licensed psychologist, and executive coach. And we have Genevieve Ama is a dedicated cognitive behavioral therapist with a decade of experience specializing in helping individuals facing emotional challenges, particularly, particularly in marginalized populations. Genevieve's career began with the NH. HS in 2012, where she held various roles, including assistant practitioner at Drayton Park Women's Crisis House and psycho psychological well-being practitioner at Brent Talking Therapies IAP. T. She furthered her ex expertise by training as a cognitive behavioral therapist with New Bucks University and also became hypo hypnobirth practitioner to improve the well-being of mothers. As a specialist, Cognitive Behavioral Therapist at Hounslow IAPT, Genevieve is, is dedicated to aiding, aiding margin, bar, marginalized individuals through her organization, The Wellbeing Blueprint. Grounded in her faith and understanding the stigma surrounding mental health, Genevieve's mission is to guide her clients to happier and more fulfilling lives by empowering them with appropriate therapy and coping strategies to overcome, overcome limitations, promote their overall well-being. Let's welcome our panelists. I have the privilege of moderating this event and I'm gonna get us right into it because a lot of this conversation revolves around this concept of the strong black woman. And Dr. Garrica Stanford is actually my executive coach. And so I'm excited to have her join and share her insight with us today. We're gonna to start off with you, Dr. Stanford. In a society that often values strength and resilience over vulnerability and softness, how can young black women embrace and celebrate their softer side? while still navigating this world with confidence? Good morning. Um, I love this question. This is such a great place to start. I think one of the most important things is really paying attention to the inner dialogue that we as Black women have around strength, resilience, vulnerability, and softness. Uh, I think sometimes society has um, led us to believe that they are in competition, that we have to choose one side over the other, where really it's about redefining what we even mean when we say strength um, and what, what that means when we say resilience, because really vulnerability is a sign of strength. And so the first part is really challenging. What is the beliefs that we have about what it means to be strong, particularly strong as a black woman? A lot of times it's about doing everything. It's about our outward actions, what others see. And we don't focus enough on our inner dialogue. What has happened internally? So I think that first part is really challenging our own narrative around what it means to be soft, what it means to be strong and not holding them in competition. So Genevieve, I'm gonna pose the same question to you. How can young black women embrace and celebrate their softer side while still navigating this world with confidence? I would add to everything that you just said. I think it's important to define softness um, and vulnerability for yourself. Um, and it's also important to understand that there's a time and place um, for being this strong black woman, um, because sometimes society requires you to be strong and resilient, but we don't always have to live that way. Um, so what I would say is how you embrace that softness is to nurture that part of you to develop it because we're not necessarily taught how to um, to be soft or to, to nurture that part. So I think maybe in everyday activities such as self-care, um, how you speak to yourself, self-compassion, these are small t tools that you can actually utilize to embrace the softness and to develop that part of that part of your brain and also to develop it into your lifestyle as well. Thank you, Genevieve. 
And Hawa, we know that so much of your advocacy and the message that you're spreading surrounds around mental health and removing that stigma. So I pose this question to you as well. How do young black women become a part of that? Embracing this softer side, nurturing their mental health and navigating this world with confidence. Sure, yeah, and I feel like um, everyone has already said something about it that is really powerful. I would just add that, um, or perhaps even rephrase it differently, would be that when we talk about reconditioning our beliefs or what it means to be strong, um, we must also begin to start the journey of reparenting ourselves. We must recognize um, the generations that back us and what they had to go through and why it was necessary to birth um, women into a society that had to be strong and, you know, strong in that sort of way. Um, but I think it's also thinking about the fact that we must also reframe the idea that soft is not weak. Hmm. I, I would say that that is so important. The soft is not weak and um, we must interrogate all of these beliefs. And I would add that lastly, we must not, we must not uh, put aside the fact that there are systemic barriers and enablers to keeping us perpetuating this idea that you know we must be this kind of people we must show up strong and haughty and all of that and also barriers that are keeping us away from actually being soft um recognizing what jennifer said about the fact that sometimes we have to show up in that way for self-preservation and for survival and so where do we begin to draw that balance and re uh, or interrogate these beliefs for ourselves, but also for larger functioning of the society. Oh, I love that. Especially when you mentioned this piece of reparenting ourselves. And when I think about this generation and your generation of leaders who are on the front lines advocating for change, there's this space of activism and being engaged in the many challenges that are faced by society, but also finding that intersection for self-care. A lot of our cohort members are like, how do I find this balance? So I'm curious for you and your work, you know, what are some ways, effective ways to care for oneself while also advocating for broader societal change? Wow, it's tough. <laughs> I'll start by saying that it, it is tough, especially when you're very passionate about the work that you do um, with activism, with change making, you're passionate about, you know, perhaps changes that are very personal to you as a person. Um, so I would say, first off, it's recognizing that, you know, you, you, there is only so much you can do. And sometimes it's a harsh reality. I remember being told this years ago, that you can shift the needle, but you have to recognize that some of the, the full change that you're hoping to see will not be present in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I like to tell young change makers is that you have to begin to value consistency over intensity. We want to work, we want to work so intensely and so hard. But one of my teachers would say, you're of no use to us in the movement if you're dead. So we need you for the long haul. So you're going to have to pace yourself. You're going to have to want to stay here for long enough and fight the good fight for long enough. Um, so it first starts with that reframing so that you know what is within your control and what is not within your control. And then when you do that, you also have to recognize that your self-care is also an act of activism as well. Because in a society that is programmed or conditioned to burn you out, resisting that is a part of your activism. So when I tell people that I sleep like nine to 12 hours on average, almost every day, they're like, oh my God, where do you get the chance to even do anything? I'm like, actually, well, that is one of the reasons that I'm able to function well. So you have to start looking at your self-care and your preservation and your wellness as a change maker, as part of the tools that will get you further um, you know, in the work that you do. So I do believe that it comes from that reorientation of what care and rest in your mental health really means um, in the context of your work. Mm. When you mentioned that piece about caring for yourself in and of itself is an act of advocacy, it reminds <laughs> me, Dr. Sanford, of many of our conversations, but especially in your work in leading executive leaders through a social change cohort. I pose that same question to you. How can black women navigate the intersection of self-care and activism? And what are some effective ways that they can take care of themselves while advocating for societal change? 
Yeah, I, I think what was just said was was exactly some of the same things that I would say, and probably what I would add to it is um, a very a saying that a lot of us have heard. It can sound really cliche, but it's what they tell us on a flight. You know, we have to put our mask on, you know, before we are able to also help someone else. And so I think that in um, a lot of Black communities, we're a collective um, culture. You know, so we definitely believe about caring for others. The hard part is that sometimes, as someone said earlier, we don't also understand or we're not taught how to also care for ourselves. And so again, we get into this place where we feel like we have to choose. And so what's the way that we really challenge ourselves, again, to think about how are we defining what advocacy means? And there are times where actually our advocacy is our self-care. There is a whole new um, information coming out about what it looks like to do collective self-care. So when we are actually advocating, really assessing, is this actually pouring into myself as I also offer to others? And so really paying attention to what's the impact of when I'm advocating for a larger society and systematic change on myself, and then what's the way that I'm making sure that I'm also prioritized doing that for myself as well, and what does that look like? The other thing that I might add to that is really to reframe when we say yes and when we say no to things. A lot of the times we are in a place where as women, we feel like it's really hard to say no to things. And so a lot of times in my work, I'll talk about how do we reframe what saying no means? That a lot of times what we might say no to is saying yes to something else. And if we get clearer to what we're saying yes to, we can also get clearer to what we're saying no to. And that allows us to be able to honor the belief that a lot of us have that we wanna make a difference that not just impacts us, but impacts generations that we will never meet. But how do we do so, like she said earlier, and be alive to see some of it um, versus just doing so much that it really um, just doesn't align with the value we have to, to serve to make change. These are such beautiful reminders and you all are filling my cup as well. I know that we have hundreds of young women watching and so I want you all to know that you can place your questions in the chat. There will be time for us to lift those up to our panelists. So go ahead and feel free to put those in the chat. So Genevieve, I'm off to you. We know that technology is honestly what's connecting us today. We're having this conversation all over the world, which is amazing. And social media and technology are integral parts of our lives. How can Black women leverage these platforms to promote mental health and wellness while also protecting their emotional boundaries? The first thing that comes to mind is um, I think it's important to share your story because your story is unique. And there's so much power in sharing your story because you connect with people and it normalizes a lot of things that people might not even talk about on a day-to-day -day basis because of things like shame. And you know, we're really blessed to be in an age where we do have platforms um, where we can share our story. Um, but then in addition to it, sometimes, you know, it can be quite challenging because sharing your story might make you vulnerable. So I think it's important to ensure that you do it at the right time for you. Um, but then in addition to it, make sure that your boundary, because it's so easy to get caught up in social media where, you know, you just feel like you want to save the world or help everyone. But realistically, you know, we, we can't. So it's important to make sure that you do set boundaries around, you know, how much you share, when you share and make time for other areas in your life as well, because, you know, that is just a fraction of your life. And it's important to not neglect other parts of your life, too. Mm. That's such a great point. How I would also pose that question to you. You know, what as you promote through many of your social media platforms and have been coined as a voice for mental health in Nigeria, how have you continued to sustain promoting mental health and wellness while also protecting your emotional boundaries? Um, um I would always start with it is tough. I think it is very important to recognize that. Uh, it's always going to be a delicate balance. It's not something that you get once and then you're like, oh, yeah, I'm done. I, I figured it out. Um, I mean, I believe that Jennifer has said it already as well. You know, when we talk about boundaries and also it was said earlier about saying no. Um, I, I, I have this mantra that I've used for a while. It's less but better. It's it's. It's in the way I share my story. It's in the way I show up in places. It's recognizing that as a person with lived experience, 
of the things that I advocate for or advocate against, um, depending on what you're looking at, I have to ensure that I prioritize myself in those settings and how I tell the stories. And so for me, it is, it is recognizing really the truth that I have to come first in the work that I do. And not first from the idea of, you know, this narcissistic abuse that is this hyper, hyper individualism um, that perhaps we're seeing in certain settings, but it's really in the case of if I do not take care of myself to the best and how can I show up as best as I can, the, 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 the quality of the stuff that I present to everyone and I can use to do my advocacy is dependent on the quality of the love that I show myself and the care that I show myself. And so whilst there are boundaries and all of that in the things that I can control externally, I also have to set boundaries with myself internally as well, which is, you know, and, and routines and things like that. I'm very, very strict on my routines. Um, it is, you know, my sleep, um, my, my, my nourishment, my nutrition, it is in my movement. It's in the people that I work with as well. It's recognizing that a lot of what we also need to examine are not just things that are physical, but things that go on on the inside. Are you are you sharing spaces and energy with the people that share your values, or people that uplift you, or people whose interaction you know does not deplete your mental strength and things like that, or areas that are triggering in ways that are unnecessary to your work. And so it, it's it's a very individual thing, but I do believe that across the board there are certain there are very there are certain values that you, you might want to use and determining what that looks like for every individual. Mm. Those are great strategies. You know, I know all of you have created a purpose around your work in removing the stigma about mental health. Genevieve, I'd love to hear from you about how can we encourage open conversations about mental health within families, communities, educational institutions, just to create a more inclusive and supportive environment for young black women around what is oftentimes a taboo conversation. It's important to literally bite the bullet and start the conversations. Um, it is a taboo often, you know, people you know, experience shame when it comes to mental health, but it's something that we all have. Um, and I think, in order to have these conversations, we need to start the conversations. And in order to start the conversations, it's important to educate ourselves as well. So on basic knowledge or information about uh, mental health, what is mental health? What are common mental health conditions such as depression, anxiety? What are the type of experiences, um, you know, sorry, the type of symptoms people experience when they experience depression and anxiety? I also think that it's important to um, promote wellness, make it as part of your lifestyle, because through your lifestyle, people actually begin to ask questions. Um, they might want to follow some of the things that you do. You're educating people um, without them even realizing as well. Um, so those are some of the things I think we can begin to do, how to start conversations, yeah. Dr. Sanford, I kick that question over to you. Yeah, I, I love that question. And I love what Genevieve said about really what's the way that we begin to start the conversation. And I think the most important person we need to start that conversation with is ourselves, you know? And so really beginning to create um, rhythms. I love rhythms over balance. I think balance puts us into a, some tension that's not necessary. So what's some rhythms that we put in place to really sit with ourselves and begin to ask, how am I? Uh, and in a really, intentional and honest way because sometimes when we hear that question we have a knee-jerk and quick response and we really haven't paused to even check in with ourselves about that so i love that idea about starting the conversation but really starting the conversation with ourselves what are our own beliefs around mental health you know a lot of times mental health really gets connected to negative things it gets connected to the worst end of the spectrum of people who are struggling but really i love what genevieve said too this idea of mental wellness how do we really get to the place that we see mental wellness the same way as physical wellness? That the same way as a female, I go every year to see my gynecologist and my check-in with a the therapist. All of us should be thinking about doing that and not thinking about accessing mental health resources when something is wrong. When we've come to the last point where we can't do anything else, how does it become a practice that is just integrated in our overall well-being and care for ourselves? So I think really kind of challenging and sitting with ourselves to think about what do I believe will open up that courage that was mentioned to how do I then begin to share with others how I'm doing? 
do I need more support? Do I need more connection? Uh, but if I haven't done that with myself, it's gonna be really hard to ask that of others. So starting with ourselves and then slowly beginning to say, who's in my circle that I really feel like that I can show my strength through my vulnerability of talking about what it is that I'm really navigating. Mm. Starting with ourselves, that's a powerful place to start. And many times a conversation that some of us can avoid and not waiting until the last minute to seek out help. So I'm going to take a question that we got from the chat. Anita had a question, and, and I'm going to double it with a question that I have for you all as well. So Hawa, we'll start with you. My question is, can you share some practical strategies or techniques for nurturing mental well-being and maintaining balance in the face of everyday pressures? And Anita's question is, how do you stay consistent with this? What are some suggestions for consistency? Wow, yeah, um, very, very good question, actually. Um, first, what can we do, and then um, consistency. I think first, in the face of, you know, maybe environmental pressures or some level of dysfunction, I think it's first important, again, going back to sort of self-reflection. Where am I? What do I have control over? Um, what can I do with what I have at the moment? Because I think a lot of times when we give some types of advice or we hear some types of advice or we take them from like books or um, very well many advice, but we need to sort of adopt and adapt to them to our own personal circumstances. Um, it's not usually a one size fits all. What I will say is that when you have done that, then you can start thinking of, you know, um, and I, I talk a lot about routines. And I say that um, routines have its patterns because whether we like it or not, we are pattern, you know, we're pattern making beings and we just keep going. Whether we do it consciously or not, we're repeating it and repeating and repeating certain things. And so a lot of times I encourage people to really look at the patterns in your life. So when you look at, um, you know, self-preservation or taking care of yourself um, in very stressful environments, that could look like switching off technology for a while. You know, that could look like putting boundaries around the time you spend on devices or screens and things like that. That could be, um, that could also be being very strict with when you go to bed and when you, you get up, you know, and face the day. That could look like what time are you allocated every day to your own self and your own personal well-being. The time for stillness, the time for self-examination. We're in a world that is go, 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 and everything is pushing you to move quickly. Everything says that if you pause, then you're wasting time. So at what point do you resist that to actually carve out time in your day to actually sit with yourself and, you know, gain consciousness of what is really going on in your internal environment? Um, so when I think about that um, and also think about consistency, different people again, different challenges. For some people, they're going to need to document it, like really put pen to paper that this is what my day to day looks like. And some people will have to take it further into actually putting that into calendars and setting alarms and things like that. I'm one of those people like I have an alarm for every single thing because I need to always in being strict and especially at the beginning of creating new habits, you have to be a little bit hard on yourself. Um, of course, with a lot of compassion for yourself, but also trying to recognize that it's not going to come easy. When you're trying to change a lifetime of conditioning how to do certain things, you're going to have to go a little bit intense at the beginning and then moderate as you go along. Um, it's also in recognizing what you consume. And when I say what you consume, it doesn't have to be from your mouth in terms of food. It's also what you consume with your eyes, what you consume with your ears as well. I'm usually very strict with those things because those are great influencers and they influence us in ways that we actually are not able to pinpoint. We just realize that, oh, I've changed over time. And then you look back and realize that, oh, my days, it's what I was listening to over time, it's what I was watching over time. Um, it is time that you're creating for movement. These are natural ways of, you know, enhancing our mental well-being. Movement could be yoga, it could be dancing, it could be cycling, it could be walking, it could be jogging, it could be going to the gym, it could be whatever it is that you do. I always tell people that the best exercise is the one that you actually do. So do something, move your body, be strict on your bedtime, wake up. And when you wake up, don't turn to technology immediately. Have some time to yourself, whether that looks like prayer, whether that looks like workout, whether that looks like just being still and having a cup of tea and just meditating and all of those things. You have to create those. You know, we tell people that success is not is not an accident, it's deliberate actions on a day to day. But we also recognize that success in mental wellness is not an accident. It is very deliberate. Anybody who you see that tries to really nurture their wellness 
you would see that they have very strict patterns around the way they, they really go about their day. I said, that is what I encourage a lot of people to do. Mm. And of course, one thing I would add to it is accountability in terms of consistency. Perhaps you want to get one or two people to kind of hold you accountable. You said so many things, Hawa, that there were a ton of quotables there, but one of those that really stood out to me is the best type of exercise for you to do is the type that you actually do. So finding the things that we enjoy, the things that we can remain consistent with. A lot of times we give the prescription on what self-care should look like versus choosing to immerse ourselves in the things that we can find joy in as we care for ourselves. So Genevieve, same question posed to you. What are some practical strategies and techniques for nurturing mental well-being and finding balance in this everyday pressures? And also I have to add in Anita's question, which is how do you stay consistent with that self-care? So I'm just adding on to what has already been said. I think it's important to make sure that you plan in advance and have a balance between all three types of activity every day. Um, Because often it's very easy to think that maybe routine activities are more important than pleasurable activities. Um, And once you plan your week in advance, follow the plan, not the mood. I always say this because once again, it's very easy to wake up and feel like, oh, I can't be bothered. But in terms of managing your wellness, it's important to make sure that you follow the plan, which is a wellness lifestyle. And once you begin to follow the plan, you will notice that wow, this is impacting me in a positive way. Um, I do believe it's important to be flexible as well. Um, I like what was previously said, that it's not about, um, it's more about rhythm, so finding your own rhythm. So, you know, if it doesn't work out for you, ask yourself, what isn't working so well with my wellness routine? Um, What can I do differently? And make adjustments as you go along. And another thing is to also notice your thoughts that plays a massive role in terms of your wellness as well. Um, because we can't you know, take every thought that we think, or sometimes we need to question our thoughts, the validity of our thoughts, and ask ourselves, you know, is what I'm thinking maybe fueling a negative emotion? And if that's the case, how can I begin to challenge it? Um, what are the unhelpful thinking habits that I have? Do I always catastrophize as soon as something happens? Or am I always thinking from an emotional place? Or, um, or am I always, personalizing things begin to challenge or ask yourself these questions because that has a massive impact in terms of how you feel and going back to the last part consistency once again i would always say follow the plan not the mood learn to become your own therapist Um, and over time it does get easier and if it isn't getting easier ask yourself what is not working and how can i make changes Mm. There are so many great points there, you know, and part of it in being able to evaluate our own mental process, Hawa said it, Genevieve said it, it's what we're listening to, it's what we're around, what are we choosing to, the self-talk that we're choosing to share with ourselves. And, you know, I didn't share this earlier, but part of the huge reason why we focused this session, we did the Embrace Your Glow event, this wasn't originally planned, But with those 2,600 plus applications that we got for the cohort, approximately 50% were young black women who shared either challenges that they had had with their own mental health, ways that they were advocating within their community. It was such a cry for a space to uh, just to share in their experiences and to receive encouragement and to support one another. And as I think about the intersectionality of black women, right? There's so much that plays into our experiences globally. I'm curious of how we can work to create more inclusive and supportive spaces that address the unique needs of black women. Each of you work in this space and I'd love for you just to touch on what we can do as a society or even specifically in the regions of the world that you're in to address challenges uniquely faced by Black women. And I will start with you, Dr. Sanford. 
Yeah, that, that's such an important um, question. Um, we are not designed to do things all on our own. So I'm a, definitely a bit um, advocate for starting with ourselves. We don't want to end with ourselves. And so it really is about how do we begin to build network um, to really be intentional about, about doing so. Um, and sometimes it's great that if we can have this kind of network and system of support within the places we work um, and where we are most of the day, and if we can, that's great. And that can be done in a lot of different ways, whether that is affinity or resource groups that's specific for women, for black women to come together and discuss what's going on in their professional spaces. But the reality of it is, is all workspaces might not be able to offer that. Of course, if we are a leader in that space, that might be something we wanna take on and create, but also making sure that just because something isn't already available to us, that we don't stop from seeking it out when we need it. So really looking to see what that looks like to create that space in our inner circles, but also tapping into resources like what WIN is offering. And so really beginning to make sure there's intentional efforts um, to build these spaces for black women. We might think about that even in our self care. So again, a lot of us are really driven to pour back into the community. How do we do that in a way that's building up resources for this next generation, perhaps in ways that we didn't have available to us. So it's looking for resources that one, fulfill us and allow us to be replenished, but also making sure that we're offering that to the next generation as well. Mm. Same question to you, Hala. Yeah, sure. Um, um, Dr. Sanford has said a lot already. Um, I, I, I just want to touch on three core things. I think the first one is, you know, making it sort of like a personal responsibility across the board to cultivate community. So that is from the person who is seeking out community to the person who um, has the opportunity or the resources to create community. And when I say community, it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical space. It could be a virtual space as well. We've done that as she writes for one over the last seven years. And the reason I say making it a personal responsibility is, for example, when I was looking for um, sort of like a safe space to talk about my mental health journey, to talk about, you know, who is talking about this and where are they talking about it? Do we have a safe space? And I didn't find it. I had to create one, you know. And so, and then I found that a lot of other people were looking for. And now there are other safe spaces, but it's just about the fact that sometimes different spaces are catered to different things, and we must all try to see how we can all contribute to cultivating community. Um, because um, you know, my own kind of community might be geared or might somehow be biased towards people with lived experience. And maybe people are seeking something slightly different. And so there is something for everyone within different communities. Um, another thing that I like to tell people is when we're talking about creating inclusive spaces, when we're talking about trying to cater to very peculiar needs of different communities or sets of individuals or regions and things like that, is that we must encourage um, the idea that we have to start before there's a crisis. A lot of times we do not have the resources to begin to respond to things or react to things. Um, we must always think of or anticipate uh, what could potentially come up or things that we have had bubbling under and then create the environment for it already. And we as individuals do not need to feel like, oh, I don't have any mental health issues. Oh, I'm good. Oh, I've not been diagnosed with anything so well. It doesn't really concern me. And so I'm not going to be there. It's thinking more with the wellness mindset as opposed to the idea of something has to be illness before then we're like, oh, yeah, that's me. Um, and I think lastly, um, and I feel like I forgot the last thing I wanted to say, but um, I, I, I think these are very good starting points with creating spaces or at least the mindset of creating or cultivating communities and spaces. Mm. I have a question from the chat that I want to ask you all. And Genevieve, I'll start with you. Faber asks, what advice and encouragement do you have for a young lady who is aspiring to make it big in her business while prioritizing self-care? You are all business owners and leaders. So I'm curious from your perspective, how do you balance being a business leader while also prioritizing your self-care? I think the best way to answer that is by making reference to a model that I, I like to look back on. And it comes from a compassion focused therapy. So if you're interested, you can Google or YouTube to get more understanding. Um, but there's a particular model called um, emotional regulation, and it looks at three systems that we have in the brain. 
The first part is the threat system. So that's the red zone. And that is the part that's always detecting maybe threat in the environment. Uh, the second part is the drive system. And that's the part that is geared for achievement, achieving goals, um, being motivated in life, mainly to survive and to be successful. And then the green zone is the place where I like to make reference to it as the soft life the soft life zone, but really it's called the self-soothing system. And the self-soothing system is the place where self-care takes place, the place where you know you speak to yourself um, nicely. It's the place where there is comfort, there is rest, there is ease. And I often ask myself, um, you know, what area are you investing more in? Um, because if you're constantly in the blue zone, which is the drive I have to achieve, or the red zone, which is detecting all the things that's wrong in society, that's going to lead to burnout. Um, so it's very important that we regulate our emotional well-being by ensuring that there's a balance between the three. Are you investing in the, the green zone, the self-soothing system? Are you spending time looking after yourself as well as you know, building your business and achieving amazing things? Are you doing the things that are in line with your values, such as spending time with maybe family, um, building relationships, um, socializing, eating good food? Um, so I think all in all, I would always ask myself, what part of the three systems am I investing most in? Is there balance between the red zone, the blue zone or the green zone? Or am I just focused on the blue zone, which will only lead to perfectionism and burnout? So um, yeah, that's how I would answer that. Mm, I love these zones. I'm going to have to definitely look that up and apply <laughs> that to my leadership. You know, as we've had this conversation today and we know that you are all mental health experts who lead organizations and talk about the importance of therapy, we also know that mental health resources are, and services are not always easily accessible or affordable for everyone. And so I'd love to hear from each of you, number one, how can our audience connect with you on social media, follow your content and what you share about mental health and wellness? But also, what are some alternative ways for Black women to seek support and prioritize their well-being? Dr. Sanford, we'll start with you. Yeah, um, I think the good part about social media, because we always like to maybe sometimes think about what's not helpful, but it's actually really growing as far as resources that are more accessible for mental health, um, whether that's through podcasts. And so there's some really great podcasts by clinicians, you are licensed clinicians, and it's important that you really are listening to people who have experience and expertise um, to really offer um, salient advice to kind of think through what's the way to care for ourselves. Um, there's great resource networks, Therapy for Black Girls, that one has really grown. There's a podcast, there's a directory that will tell you about therapists in your area. So the, th same, the th same way that we think of and use social media for entertainment or whatever purposes that we use, what's the way we can really tap into resources that are out there? Um, podcasts can be a, a really great one. So I think sometimes people are still kind of getting more comfortable about thinking about seeking a therapist or maybe just listening to a therapist on a podcast or reading a book. There's some really great books about the um, mental health of black women um, that are really great. And so what's the way that we begin to explore some of that information as well? I think taking opportunities like today, you know, when we see something come across social media that's talking about mental wellness and particularly mental wellness for us as black women, how do we get curious and, and take the opportunity to tap into that? Um, I'm on social media at Dr. Garica on Instagram and then Dr. Garica Stanford on Facebook as well. Um, and so really think that just opportunities like this will be the ones that we continue to break down the stigma around mental health by just talking about it. And I love that we've all been talking about how do we reframe it to really mental wellness versus thinking about mental illness and the more severe aspects of it. Thank you for sharing, Dr. Stanford. Hawa, off to you. Yeah, sure. Um, Resources, find me, okay, social media at Hawa underscore OJ4, O-J-E-I-F-O. And my organization, She Writes, Women Mental Health Initiative is at She Writes, that's a W-R-I-T-E-S. She Writes Woman on Instagram and She Writes Woman underscore on Twitter. And for those in Nigeria, we, we have free resources. Um, we run a 24-7 toll-free mental health helpline. 
uh, which allows you to speak directly with counselors. So that's 0800-800-2000, um, 0800-800-2000. And we have free and unlimited teletherapy as well. These are donor funded projects, so please utilize them as much as you can and share these with people. Uh, you never know who might be in need. I just wanted to build up on what Dr. Sanford said about, you know, also looking at other kinds of ways to get resources around you. And I think for me, what has really helped is um, following on social media culturally sensitive mental health professionals, um, authors, uh, you know, and the likes really. Um, sometimes you see certain kinds of mental health information and you know, that, oh yeah, this sounds good, but I don't think this particularly works in my own context. And so sometimes context specific mental health professionals or thought leaders can be very, very useful uh, for us individually. Um, yeah, I, I would say, yeah, I would just stop there. Thank you. And so I know that our Women Empowering Nations team is dropping the social media handles in the chat for you all to follow, like, and share. Also follow at We Nations and share your reflections from today. But now I want to turn that question over to you, Genevieve. Number one is how do we find you? How do we get to follow the resources that you share? And also, you know, understanding that mental health support is not always accessible and affordable. What are some alternative ways that we can seek that support? Hi, so you can find me at the Wellbeing Blueprint on um, Instagram. And in terms of resources, in addition to what's been said, I would say, um, if you're a student, maybe um, check out uh, to see what's available because sometimes um, there are counselling services. Um, if you are employed, uh, maybe under occupational health, there is a counselling service that could offer you free support as well. Um, and also Google. There are organisations out there that offer free therapy. Um, so it is available. Um, sometimes it just requires a bit more work to find. Yeah. Thank you. So we're about to close up our time today. And my last question, I'm going to leave this kind of open for you all to share. What is one key takeaway that you want for our audience to take from this discussion and leave from your reflections about the mental health and well-being of Black women? We'll start with you, Hawa. Oh, yeah, you put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> I would say, um, yeah, what is one thing that is so hard? Uh, I would say, yeah, that is really hard. I would say maybe perhaps the first thing we need to, I think self-examination, examining the whys. Why do we think the way we do? Why do we have the image that we have? Why do we think we need to be strong? Why do we, and the reason I say that is not for any sort of shame, is really to understand where it comes from and to ask ourselves, do I need to carry this along? There are certain things that are that were necessary to bring us to where we are at now, but we can drop them for where we're headed to. So what does the ideal life look like for you, given your circumstances? And is it enough for these values and beliefs and experiences that they're enough to take me to where I'm going? And so I will start with why, self-examination. Why am I the way I am? And why do I do the things that I do? Mm, that's a great journal question for us to all apply when we leave here, examining ourselves, why asking ourselves the whys i'll turn it over to you dr sanford yeah i love of course the why it's my, one of my favorite things is chasing the why i think what i would add to that too is to really offer self-compassion and grace to ourselves on this journey um, we are so great at offering that to other people but really not as great as offering that to ourselves so for a lot of us even thinking about mental wellness thinking about caring for ourselves is the first time we're doing that in our families a lot of us didn't watch our mothers and our grandmothers resting. Rest was not thought of something that they had access to and for numerous reasons. So what's the way that we're giving ourselves grace and compassion as we are trying to put new practices into place? Making sure we have the right metric. So sometimes we want a metric that's about the outcome. Did I do it? Yes or no? And, and that's one metric, but the other metric could be the why. What got in the way of me doing it? What stopped it? And then how do I need to attend to that as well? So having compassion, having grace for ourselves, really making sure that we have the right metric, um, and then really begin to try to access caring for ourselves in small ways versus always going for the big way. I love to travel. That's my biggest way to self-care, but I can't travel every day. So what's the way that in daily practices, I can take five minutes, I can take 10 minutes. When a meeting falls off my schedule, how do I not jump to my to-do list, but I take a moment and I just sit. 
Maybe I do listen to something, but maybe I just sit in stillness. So really looking for accessible ways every day that I'm able to just sit with myself, really kind of restore, replenish, um, and really checking in to make sure that our self-care practices are really offering care for ourselves. Mm, I love that. Genevieve, you will close us out. What are your thoughts? Um, in addition to all the amazing things that have been said, I would say um, you are allowed to change. You don't have to be the same way. Um, you are allowed to learn how to care for yourself and self-care can be a lifestyle. You don't have to make excuses for it. You can embrace it. Um, it's okay to be soft. You don't always have to be strong. Um, some people might find it hard when they see your change, but really it's about you. And often people tend to follow on when the change begins. Um, so take care of yourself. Like I always say, you can't pour out an empty cup. Um, so it's imperative that you look after yourself, self-care and change if you feel like you want to. Thank you, Genevieve. We cannot pour from an empty cup and it's okay to change. Today is a new day and it's okay to start again. And so I am just so honored to have been able to share this space with each of you and hear your perspectives and come together as black women of the African diaspora to discuss the most important asset we have, our well-being. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Let's show them some love in the chat. And now we'll turn it back over to Demetria Kinsley. Uh, if anyone out there is anything like me, I mean, as a mom and a wife and executive, oldest of 14 siblings, um, daughter, life can kind of come at you pretty hard sometimes and it can feel overwhelming and you've got to be tough and you've got to be strong. And if you, you bend a little bit, you just might break. And I think what is so powerful and what's so important, if you do nothing else today, is to take some of these things that are being said. You got to take the time, that emotional regulation that Genevieve was talking about. Where, what zone are you in? That self-examination, like where, where, where am I, right? Um, it's not about intensity, it's about consistency. That's the hardest part, being consistent. When you got all these things coming at you, continuing to press on, and that's where your community comes in play. Um, I mean, it's just, it's just so many. We we're taught that soft is weak. Soft is not weak. Soft is activism. Soft is self-preservation. Like her twelve hours of sleep, people might think, oh, she's lazy. She's not doing. No, she is preserving because when she wakes up, get ready, world. Here she comes, and she is making change. You can't do that if you're burnt out. haven't taken the time to be able to sit with yourself and start with you and really evaluate where am I? Because I can't be if I don't figure out where I am first. So I'm telling you, I, I am, this is one of the most exciting parts of being the global VP of marketing at Cantu Beauty. It is championing change. It is changing generational curses. It's changing the cycle. It's really making an impact in the community that we serve. It's so much more than about selling products. Uh, it's really about the individuals that that not only use our products but are behind our products um it's easy to write a check right and which is definitely needed and super important and recognized we we, we are going beyond that by physically showing up getting involved and ultimately giving our time our partnership with women empowering nations is part of Cantu's commitment to elevating and uplift, uplifting black and brown communities worldwide on their path to leadership. That's why last year we launched the first ever 2022 Glow Girls Leading Our World Global Cohort and joined forces again this year to continue supporting the next generation of female leaders by giving them access to the resources that need to accelerate their personal path to potential and ultimately profit. Give Back is so close to my heart, as you can see, I'm super passionate about it. And Carlisha, founder and director of Women Empowering Nations, is dedicated to cultivating purpose in young women. Cantu is a global brand, 
And we wanted to partner with an organization with a global friend footprint that understands the importance of community impact and platforms we have before us. Um, this has just been such a powerful, powerful, powerful partnership. It continues to be the gift that keeps on giving. Um, this is our fifth year with Women Empowering Nation and, and we're just only getting started. I'm so grateful for this partnership, Demetria, and all that we've been able to accomplish. And we want to give you all a peek, a peek at what we did this week. Some people might be like, that is wild. How in the world did you all think that you were going to pop up in seven different countries in one week leading up to today? But we did. Demetria was here with me in Tulsa, Oklahoma on Thursday. And we're gonna roll a clip, I, it, I can show you better than I can tell you about it, to share some of the impact that we had with our global give back events. So we had our 2023 cohort members as they concluded their cohort, they were provided resources and funding to plan pop-ups within their cities all over the globe that focused on self-care and the well-being of black women. And they chose to partner with various organizations and support their communities in the most meaningful and touching ways. I'm going to share with you the highlight from Tulsa first, and then we'll talk some more about what else happened around the world. Hey, it's Carlisha Bradley, founder of Women Empowering Nation, and I am so excited that we are in Tulsa, Oklahoma, my hometown, where WIM was founded. Today, we are partnering with our 2023 Global Global Cohort as they have put on an amazing day of self-care for Black mothers. Hi, y'all. My name is Janae, and I'm here with Women Empowering Nations at Poppy's hosting an event for beautiful single mothers who are women of color. We know how hard it is for you to just relax and take some time for yourself when you're so busy taking care of your family and other responsibilities. So we wanted to make this an environment for them to just relax and unwind. So um, with kids at the house, I really never get to partake in self-care time. Um, so this is very, I, I'm, I'm really appreciative of this time. So I found out about the spa day through James Inc. Miss Bell introduced me into this for single mothers. Um, the thing that I'm looking most forward to is a massage, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I definitely need a massage, I haven't had one in a long time. It looks so pretty. <laughs> it's, not, it's very nice. <laughs> very nice. Yes. You deserve it. Oh, well, thank you so much. <laughs> what do you see for yourself? What do you want your legacy to be? It sounds so cliche. Freedom. Mm. I want it to be freedom of Mindset. Hi, my name is Alisa Bell. I'm the executive director and founder of James Inc. It was important for us to partner with uh, Women Empowering Nations and be a part of this event because the young mothers, the young women that we serve wouldn't necessarily get this opportunity any other way. It smells so good. Oh my God, I love it! The thing I'm most looking forward to is like the camaraderie with other women that are like myself because I stay in the house all the time so to be able to get out and to see somebody and have conversate was like the thing that made me most excited. What were your biggest giants and how did you overcome I really enjoyed the event because it was fun and it was a lot of black women involved into it. Nobody knows it's turned up. Everything was great and I experienced a real welcoming and warm entrance. I enjoyed the most of the massages and the actual talking and bonding about different things that we can all relate to. I feel like I'm about to fall over. I'm walking on the cloud right now. <laughs> <laughs> you enjoy it? As we continue to embark on this partnership with Cantu for the Glow Global Cohort, we are seeing our investment in 50 girls scale into an investment in thousands as they put on these events in nine different cities all around the world. And we are finishing up our U.S. tour with Tulsa today. And we couldn't do any of this without Cantu, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, as we could see in Tulsa, it was such a special day. And we not only got to do this in Tulsa, but we also did it in eight other cities and in six countries around the world. We were in Atlanta, New York City, Paris, London, Cape Town, Accra, Ghana, and Abuja, Nigeria. Let's take a look at the work of our GLOW Global cohort members and the impact of their efforts around the world. 
So we are in Atlanta today. ATL. Women Empowering Nations and Cantu Beauty are hosting in partnership with our GLOW Global Cohort, our 2023 cohort. They are hosting pop-ups of give back events all over the world, y'all. All over. All over. So today we're in Atlanta and we are doing a day of self-care, makeovers, food, hair for women who are experiencing homelessness. And we are just so grateful to get to work with all of these amazing community partners. We're going to show you what's happening today. So come along with us. All I can say after I see that is, wow, I'm so proud of our cohort members. They planned and executed these events all over the world in partnership with Cantu. And Demetria, I just thank you and the Cantu team for showing up globally with us for this. Hey, this was phenomenal. And I want to give my thanks to, to, I know the ladies of the cohort put a lot of time a lot of effort, a lot of personal time, weekends to get this together and put this, put, put this together in such a phenomenal way. And also I wanna thank our Cantu team members who are showed up and our distributor partners and our agency partners in each country to support this cause. So thank you so, so, so much to everybody. And then thank you to you too, Carlisha, and your, and your staff and Destiny for coordinating and putting this together because without you guys, we would not be here. So thank you so much. Thank you. I mean, I I was amazed. Like I said before, last year we did the cohort experience. The girls got to have the experience of the fellowship working side by side with the brand, traveling abroad to Ghana. And this year, when we thought about investing in leaders, we gave the resources back to them. We scaled from impacting 50 
to over a thousand. And so, yes, I'm so grateful for all of the synergy, all of the partnership, and huge shout out to Destiny, our program director on the Women Empowering Nations team. It just truly took an effort to make it happen, and we made it happen. And so we're here today, we're about to wrap up some of our time at Embrace Your Glow, but we wanted to get in some movement. We know Hawa talked about getting out there and moving, Genevieve, Dr. Sanford, a part of our well-being is also our, our health and the care for ourselves. And I am elated that we get to have Angie Franklin, the founder and CEO of Afro Yoga, to join us today for a live Afro Yoga session a live session with each of you. She is a four-time Lululemon ambassador and yoga practitioner of over 20 years. She teaches from a culture-focused perspective, specializing in a new style of yoga she calls Kimasa, where the traditions of African and Indian yoga meet. Over the last seven years, Angie has built a loyal grassroots community that has grown into a global movement whose aim is to disrupt the wellness industry status quo. And she's doing that. I know her personally, and she is a game changer. Angie has partnered with, a venture, with venture capital firms to support founder wellness and Fortune 500 companies like Lululemon, the NBA, Duolingo, Blue Shield, Kaiser Permanente, and more to develop and facilitate wellness programming. With no further ado, I turn it over to Angie Franklin. Hi, We Nations family. It's such an honor to be here. Carlisha, I am such a fan of your work, your impact, your vision. So shout out to you and also to your team behind the scenes who is helping make all of this happen. Demetria and the Can2 team and all of you incredible We Nations folks from around the world who are creating incredible impact. Um, it's such an honor to be here and to be a part of this and to bring something to you that is near and dear to my heart. Um, so as Carlisha mentioned, movement is a very important part of wellness. And so what we'll be doing today is flowing through a comedic yoga class. I think it's really important to understand what you're doing and definitions and terms are key in this. So I wanna take a moment to just educate you briefly. So Kemet is the original name for Egypt. Egypt is the name that the Greeks gave it. So Kemetic yoga is a style of yoga that originates in ancient Egypt. Um, and it's not well known, right? That, that this is a style and a practice that, that has roots in Africa. So um, it's been incredibly important, particularly for uh, the African diaspora or around the world to know about this practice and to participate in this practice. So I'm excited for you to get to feel that in your own body. Um, yoga is an Indian Sanskrit word that means to unite, to yoga to unite. It's this concept and this idea about mind, body, and spirit together. So yoga is really about this concept of union, getting in touch with yourself, uh, more than it is about being flexible, being able to touch your toes, um, being in shape, you know, having what, what people have put out in media about a yoga body, anybody with a body can practice yoga. And this practice is accessible and available to all of us. Um, so they say it's not about touching your toes, but what you learn on the way down. And so this practice is, is a beautiful way to get in touch with yourself. And so I'm gonna guide you through that practice. All right, so if you um, are not on a yoga mat, you can sit in a chair and see where you can follow along. And if you came with your yoga mat ready to go, then I'd love to meet you there. So we're gonna go ahead and start in a seat. And just relax your hands down at your thighs or somewhere you don't have to think about them too much. And you can gently start to soften your gaze, which means to maybe start to close the eyelids a little bit or focus on a specific point in the room. And if you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes all the way down. And as I always say, both on and off the mat, everything begins with awareness. So let's start by just turning our attention inwards. Taking a moment to notice and feel into the breath. And there are both subtle and obvious parts that we can notice here. So you may notice the movement of your body as you breathe, your chest or your belly may move with your breath. Or you may notice more subtle things like the coolness of your inhales and the warmth of your exhales. 
You may notice also the rhythm and the pace of your breath. Is it a long, deep breath, or is it maybe a little more short and shallow? And I encourage you that as I walk you through these steps of awareness to not, in, not try to change anything or alter anything, just really noticing where you are and what already is. We're gonna to start to shift that attention to the body. So think about the way that the light scans the paper in a scanner and it slowly makes its way down. I want you to do that with your mind's eye and start to move your attention through your body like that light scanning through your body and noticing as you move through what parts of the body may feel really open and spacious and light and where some tension or tightness may have accumulated. There's any discomfort. And again, we're not placing judgment. We're not deciding what that means. We're simply just letting ourselves become aware, tuning in, starting to build that connection with self. And then lastly, so many feelings and emotions can come from being a part of an event like this. So just take a moment to notice what you're feeling in this moment. You may notice joy, excitement, nervousness. You may be feeling really full and uplifted. So see if you can come to decide or notice what that is by simplifying it to a single word that can identify that feeling. And then let's just start by moving into the body. I always like to offer space here for free individual flow, intuitive movement, which is just like that there's no right or wrong way to do any of this here. It's just kind of starting to feel into the edges of your range of motion Noticing what feels tight, what feels open, and you can really explore here. So you can take your arms up and out, your legs, and again, just kind of taking note and noticing what is showing up in the body. All right? And then let's all start to make our way slowly back to this tabletop. As you breathe in, let the belly drop and the tailbone and the heart come up. On the exhale, you're gonna press the earth away from you and round your spine up to the sky. Two more of these, breathe in, let the belly drop, heart opens between the arms. Exhale, round it up. One more breath in, peel it open. And then round it back. Beautiful, coming back to a neutral spine. All right, we're gonna bring the knees together. We're gonna tuck the toes and then bring your hands down at the sides of your knees coming onto the fingertips. Moving into our first comedic posture. So feel the weight of your body first in your fingertips and then as you breathe in and breathe out, start to release and feel that weight shift from your hips to your heels. Good, bring your arms up shoulder length and then relax them at your thighs. Now, I know that your toes will be talking to you here in just a moment. Um, and so we're, what we're doing here is we're opening through the feet. Every single point on your body also resides in your feet and in your hands. So we're gently starting to open up, or maybe not so gently, starting to open up the chest all the way through the crown of the head. So see if you can stay here with me for another three, two, one, bringing the arms up. Releasing down and then picking up the toes, maybe giving them a little wiggle, some gentle taps. And then we're going to move the hands into the same position as we just did. So fingertips on the mat and then shift that weight to your hips and heels. This time as we bring the arms up, we're going to make a pyramid shape with the hands. Release it to the mat, let the elbows fan out and see if you can drop your forehead to the center. So as you land and settle, feeling back into your breath, noticing your rhythm, maybe feeling the belly expand towards the thighs. 
and allowing this to be a space of rest. At any point in this practice, if you need a pause, this is the place you can come back to. We call this Markut Mesu Haru, which means pyramid child's pose. All right, let's start to raise back up. Bring the arms up again at shoulder length. And then exhaling to release them down and bringing the hips back up. Let's go ahead and bring the knees back underneath the hips. We're going to move into the Kemetic Sun Salutation. All right, so we're going to bring the left leg up to the top of the mat. So once you're up here, even if you have to scoot your foot up, you want your knee and ankle in alignment. All right, we're going to press through that left foot and both arms are going to sweep under and kind of hug yourself back in. All right, as you have that left foot pressed into the mat, you're going to rise up, bringing your arms with you. Palms are going to touch. And then you're going to have your left hand come behind your right and open your palms to the front. Full breath in. As you exhale, slowly releasing your hands down to the knee. Take your time. Oh, it's okay if you're a little wobbly or shaky. I am a little bit too, and that's normal. Perfection is never the goal and never expected, right? It's about being in your practice. So as we breathe in, you can stay here or maybe long, uh, elongate the length in the arms and take a baby back bend here, opening your heart gently to the sky. Full breath in. Bring your chin back towards your chest, your chest back towards your thighs, and your hands back to the mat. Beautiful. All right. Y'all still with me? <laughs> Let's tuck the back toe, lift that back knee, and step the left foot back. If you've practiced yoga before, you may know this is downward dog, but we're going to mix it up a little bit. So bring your feet up a little bit more. We're going to do a comedic style in Merkut pose. So in Merkut, the feet are a little bit higher forward towards the hands, not too much. And this is to make space for the heels to touch towards the ground. Now, looking up at the hands, they're still spread open, pressing against the earth, and the chest is drawing gently back to the thighs. So you're gonna feel some um, sensations here through the back of the legs, so just breathe. And then let's take the heels up on the breath in, and lower the knees underneath the hips on the breath out. You can take your time here. Let the tops of the feet flip, Take the hips back towards the heels and let the elbows bend so that the forearms come down to the ground. Now, this pose may look familiar, but this is a sphinx pose, or what we call Haruwa Makit. And so in this posture, um, just like the sphinx in Kemet, this is a very regal and strong pose. So our gaze is lifted. Our heart is open. My collarbones are wide. So I want you to feel sort of that subtle strength and power and regalness of this pose. Taking a full breath in. And on the exhale, lengthen your arms out to the corners of your mat. You're going to imagine you're rolling a marble with your nose and bend your elbows out wide, sweeping up. Pressing through the hands and maybe lifting the hips off of the mat. Keeping the heart open in front of you, full breath in. On the exhale, we're going to start to bring the hips up and back to that Merkut. So remember, once you come back, maybe move your feet up a little bit so your heels have space to move towards the earth. They may or may not touch. Full breath in and out. All right, heels are going to raise again on the breath in, and knees are going to lower on the breath out. Beautiful. Tops of the feet can come untucked. So let's bring the right leg to the top of the mat this time. All right, right leg to the top. So we want that ankle underneath the knee. And then we're going to bring both hands underneath the knee, press through that right foot, and rise up. Exhale, palms knee. Left hand behind the right, both palms open to the front, full breath in. 
and slow release. Hands coming down to the down to the knee. All right. Once you land, feel free to maybe lengthen through the arms on the inhale. Maybe that small back bend on the exhale. And then the next breath in starts to bring you back forward. Relax the hands down at the mat, tuck the toes, lift the back knee. And this time, instead of stepping back, we're going to step forward. So bring some space between your feet, about ankle distance apart, or hip distance apart, with it. And bend your knees a lot. So really let the upper body sort of hang heavy. You can grab opposite elbows if that feels good. Sometimes it can feel nice to sway back and forth or side to side. And then just coming back to your breath. All right. Okay. Let's start to very gently roll all the way to stand. Your head will be the last thing to come up. All right. So let's breathe the arms up overhead. And then on the exhale, instead of bringing them to heart center, we're going to bring them back down at the sides. We're going to hinge the elbows in towards the hips and let the palms face out. This is a pose of Selket. She's known as a protector, goddess, and deity that would sit at the front of the tombs of pharaohs, protecting them into the afterlife. So fill your, free, fill your feet, <laughs> press firmly into the mat, drawing strength through the legs. Fill your spine, stay tall. Again, these postures are regal and powerful. I want you to feel that and the palms facing out, radiating energy. Full breath in. And out, let the hands relax at the sides. We're gonna sweep the arms back up, breath in. And exhale out to a T this time. Okay, we're gonna bring the left hand into the heart and then the right, maybe making a small pyramid with the thumbs here. As you breathe in, you're gonna rotate just your upper body to the left. Left arm is gonna open up behind you and then you're gonna bend at the elbow. Full breath in. On your exhale, you're gonna bring your gaze over your right shoulder looking ahead. Full breath in. Exhale, chin over chest and then bring your gaze behind you. Full breath in. Exhale, chin over chest, and then we're going to rotate the upper body back to the front, letting the left hand slide back underneath the right. On the next inhale, bring your arms up and out. Beautiful. We're going to do that again on the other side. Breathe the arms up. On the exhale, arms are going to come back out to a T. Left hand's gonna come into the chest and the right folds over. Again, maybe making that small connection between the thumbs. Full breath in. Rotate now just the upper body to the right. Open the right arm behind you and then bend at the elbow. Full breath in. Bring your gaze over the front. Breathe in, chin over chest. Exhale to the back. Good, chin over chest, breathe in. And then rotate your upper body back to the front and release your right hand on top of the left. Let your arms come up and out like the big fan of a palm tree. Releasing your hands back at your sides. When they reach back down to the mat, just take a moment to let the energy settle. Taking a pause to really notice what are you feeling internally as a result of the practice? Is there anything that feels different? All right. Arms are going to rise, breath in. Exhale, hands to the heart center. We're going to move into sort of the last of the standing postures. 
All right, we're gonna move into the pose of immortality. Um, everybody's body is different and everybody has different bone structure, different flexibilities. Um, and again, it's really more about what you're feeling internally than, than what it looks like, right? I always say internal experience over external appearance. Remember that. So we're gonna bring the hands to the heart center, moving into the pose of immortality. You can have your foot flat. If this is not comfortable, you can be here. And if this is not accessible, you can also be lifted. So whatever this looks like for you is great. All right, hands are gonna be at the heart. Take a breath in. On the exhale, let's rotate out to the right. Left elbow is gonna kind of hinge in towards the knee. This is gonna give space as they press gently towards each other to peel your heart open a little more. Fingertips are gonna touch and palms are gonna open, breath in. On the exhale, open the arms. And then we're gonna make what we call comedic fist, rolling the fingers in and closing the thumbs. Full breath in. On the exhale, our gaze comes to the front. Breathe in, chin over chest. Exhale, gaze to the back. And then the right fist, you're gonna watch it slowly come to meet the left. When they come back together, hands come to the heart, breath in. And then we're gonna rise, coming back up. I used my hands to help me on that one. Did you see that? And then you bring the right knee back in and release. All right, let's shake it out. We're gonna take it on one more side. Y'all are doing great. Arms are gonna rise, breathe in. Palms come down to the heart center. Okay, this time we're coming on to the other side. Left knee is gonna come into the chest. Top of the foot comes flat on the mat behind you. And then gently tuck your hips forward, slow release. One side may look completely different from the other, so you may have more or less mobility or range on one side, and that's okay. All right, we work with what we have. Hands at the heart, breath in. On the exhale, this time we're gonna rotate to the left, maybe the right elbow and the knee hinge. Fingertips touch, palms open, breath in. And exhale, open the arms out. Comedic fist, rolling the fingers and closing the thumbs, breathe in. Gaze over the right fist. Breathe in, chin over chest. Exhale, bringing our gaze to the back. And then on the next inhale, slowly watching this left fist come to meet the right. Arms open, hands come back to the heart, breathe in. And then exhale the hands down to the mat. This time we're just gonna bring both knees together to sit. Let's bring the arms up shoulder length and release them down and then just take a moment again to notice what is the internal experience. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It matters what it feels like. And then in the way that's easiest for you, we're just gonna kick out the legs to the front and start to close the practice with a few more gentle postures. So let's slide the hips towards the center of the mat. I want you to start by just coming down to your forearms. So in this way, when they're down, your shoulders should be supported with your elbows underneath them. And then we're gonna lengthen the left leg. All right, the right arm is gonna to come to the inside of that leg. And so what's really easy to do is kind of slouch back and sink into the shoulders. We wanna raise and lift the chest. Remember this practice is about power, poise, regalness, strength, right? All those things that already exist within you. These postures just embody those feelings, those characters. Full breath in. Gentle spinal twist, and then release the right one down. All right, let's switch it up. Let's bring the left knee in, right leg comes long, and then we're gonna bring the left hand to the inner knee. Gently now looking towards the right, take a full breath in. Again, keeping the chest lifted, keeping the strength and the power in this pose. And 
then releasing down. Okay, we're gonna come all the way onto our back now. All right, so if you have to readjust yourself on your mat to make sure you're laying flat and that you have enough space, bring your knees into your chest. Maybe gently swaying side to side, massaging your spine into the mat. And then letting the knees come out a little bit wider towards the edges. I want to bring the arms to the inner knees. Now, this is not a comedic yoga pose per se, but it is one that is near and dear. Um, and just a wonderful pose to close the practice with. It's called Happy Baby. So from here, you can reach your hands, uh, bringing your arms to the inner knees. You can bring your hands to wrap around your ankles. Or maybe you take your peace fingers to your big toes. And when you're ready, you start to lift the soles of your feet to the sky and kind of stamp the ceiling with them. And it can feel good to sway gently side to side. You may want to alternate lengthening through your legs. Or maybe you want to bind your feet for an aerial butterfly. There's a lot of places you can go from here. My encouragement to you is just to find what feels good and stay with it. Coming back to your breath. Slow, steady inhales and exhales. Making a little bit of space at the top and the bottom of the breath. And then let's start to release the hold of the hands, bringing the knees back towards each other and squeezing yourself in. And then taking up some space on your mat. So let your arms and legs come long, hands come down to the mat. Some options that you have here, maybe bringing the hands onto the body at the heart and the belly. Maybe bringing your hands to face down at the earth for a sense of grounding. Maybe the palms are open and up to the sky if you're feeling especially receptive. And let's take a full breath in here together through the nose and out through the mouth. And sort of really surrendering our weight to the earth. There's no more work left to do. Giving yourself the opportunity for true relaxation, for true rest. Feel the entire backside of your body kind of melt into the earth the way that a popsicle melts under the summer sun. Softening into your body, softening to the earth. Also letting the entire front side of your body relax and ease. And I want you to stay here for a few moments. Just noticing, feeling into your breath, really coming into that union with self. Knowing that everything else can wait in this moment right now is just for you. So stay here quietly and you will hear my voice in just a moment to start to guide you out.
Remember that when your mind starts to wander, your breath is your anchor to the moment. It is your direct connection back to yourself. So start to feel into and notice your breath again. Consider bringing some movement to your fingers and your toes, coming back to yourself, feeling into your physical body, your form. If it sounds good, feels good, you can take your arms up overhead for a beautiful big stretch and a breath in. And on the exhale, you're going to come onto one side or the other for what we call a fetal position. You may know this one so just curling yourself up maybe using your arm as a pillow just taking a moment to continue to just steep in the goodness and the richness of this practice and so whatever feeling is present for you maybe some peace and calm maybe you feel at ease Take a full breath in and out. And then use your outer hand to gently press you up into a seat. Take your time as you rise and settle back in. Let your hands relax back at your knees. And we're going to seal our practice, something that my Comedic instructor, your Sarah Rahotep, who is my upper lineage, taught me. Bringing the hands out to the mat, rotating the palms up, breathing in. Exhale, palms touch. You're gonna rotate the palms back out, and we're gonna take our time releasing the hands down. So take a breath in, and as many exhales, as many breaths as you need coming back down. Slow release, visualizing a beautiful shield, protective energy, sealing your practice. All of the goodness that you received, all the goodness that you gave. As your hands reach back down to the mat, just take a moment to visualize and feel into that arc of energy around you. And then bring your hands together at your heart center. Knowing that you hold so much beauty, power, strength, that you matter, that this world needs you, and that you are connected to a beautiful network of others who are equally as powerful, as beautiful, as potent as you in this world. So know that you are never alone in this journey. In Kometic Yoga, we close with the word hotep, which means peace. So to each of you, much love and hotep. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed yourself in this practice and know that the yoga is always where you are. You don't need to be anywhere specific practicing with me or in a studio or anything of that nature is where you are and the moment that you take to be with your breath and with yourself. Until next time. Bye, y'all. Wow. I needed that. The breath work, everything. I'm sitting at the desk, but I was there in this experience. And thank you so much, Angie. Absolutely a beautiful and perfect way to conclude our time together today with Angie Franklin, founder and CEO of Afro Yoga. She is truly disrupting the wellness industry and the status quo. And I'm so grateful for the gifts that she brings into this world and the strategies that she gave us today to care for ourselves. Like she said, we don't have to be in a certain place or with a certain structure. 
instructor to practice these wellness strategies and caring for ourselves, we can be anywhere. And as we close out this event today, I have to thank again our speakers, Dr. Garika Sanford, Genevieve Ama, and Hawa Ojefo, who joined us to share on the panel this morning. I encourage those of you that attended today, we put in the chat, choose the person that you're sharing this with. A lot of times we wrap these conversations in a stigma about mental health, but what we saw today was absolutely beautiful. A session created by black women for black women, focusing in on how we care for ourselves and our well being, all supported and powered by Cantu Beauty. Thank you again, Demetria, for being with us today as my co host on this journey. Empowered and just so ready for the next chapter. This experience, this day, this cohort is just amazing. Um, it's just an honor to be here. Uh, from Cantu, we will continue to nourish all your curls, coils, waves around the world. But as Angie said, the internal experience trumps the outward appearance. So you guys, we will continue this journey together to really nourish your soul. Um, we will be all around the world. We have different partners continue to sign up for this amazing, amazing program. This is not the last of us you will see. So, so exciting. Thank you everyone for all your work today. This has just been amazing. Yes, definitely stay connected with us. We put in there how you could join the Glow Global Network, joining the mailing list, following us on Instagram at We Nations, following Cantu Beauty at Cantu Beauty. We are just honored to have been able to put this on for you today and want for you to stay connected and get plugged in and get ready for the 2024 Glow Global Cohort. It's been wonderful. Bye everybody. Bye, thank you. <laughs> Women Empowering Nations, in partnership with Cantu Beauty, hosted the 2023 Glow Global Cohort, bringing together 50 leaders from seven countries around the world. Hear reflections from some of our cohort members from around the world. My cohort experience has been amazing. The most important thing about this is really bringing Black women from all across the diaspora to be in community with one another, to support each other, motivate each other. The session comes, you go blow the way and you're like, this is my favorite session. And then you go for the next one and then it exceeds it. And you're like, no, forget it. This is my favorite session. It feels like now in my journey, either professionally or personally, I have people that I can walk with and that I'm never alone. Interacting with women across the diaspora has always been a dream of mine. Black people are really everywhere. <laughs> Seeing Black women from all over seven different countries has, it's been, I can't even give it a word. It's just been mind blowing. And this photo right here, I think, reminds me of the spirit of glow and holding hands across the world. We don't usually see women going out for what they want so passionately. Some people were like, they work with politicians. They, um, some people are doing media, some people are into, into PR. And one thing that was really surprising for me was when Abba, we had a conversation with Abba and she said that she works at the White House and I'm like, how old are you? What I think the benefit of sisterhood is, is the constant reminder of not fitting yourself to be in the space you are, but thinking about how you can bring yourself to every space. So how I would pitch the, this experience to other women like me, this is bigger than leadership development. This is personal development, right? And I'm just so excited to see like how we grow as a community after this experience. And I feel like so many other girls need to know about this opportunity because it's definitely changed my life personally and professionally. Like when I started the program, I was so lost with whatever I wanted to do with my life. I didn't have much confidence and now I just feel empowered. This cohort made me more confident about telling my story. I, I don't think I've ever experienced anything this good. I feel like I just mature like 10 years in just a span of a few weeks. I think this experience has made me see myself in ways that I didn't want to see myself. And it's so, it's so illuminating in who I am and it's given me the space to kind of 
be okay with existing in my blackness and being a woman and being Muslim and all these parts of me that have been celebrated here, it's made me want to celebrate them like outside of this space. I think having a program that was specifically focused on black women, run by black women to serve black women with amazing, empowering black women speaking with us. I don't know if I would have found that anywhere else. And that's why I was so thrilled to be one of the 50 chosen.